the purpose of this particular panel is to actually set up the conference theme, uh, Marketing Made Smarter. Um, Ajay Chandwani actually talked a little bit about how we sort of uh, arrived at this. Uh, I want to give you a little more background, which is a little different from what he told you. Uh, fundamentally, the background was that uh, this was going to be one of the first uh, significant direct marketing conventions that was being planned by uh, Vatsal, Sanjeev, and their team. Um, and the reality is that in India, while uh, direct marketing um, is a fair bit of conversation, it's actually a somewhat poor, unheralded cousin um, compared to the real, the, the mainstream marketing and advertising world. And the, the objective was that this particular convention should be, in a sense, like a wake-up call uh, for the marketing advertising community, including ourselves, uh, to tell people really how much the world's changed, right? Uh, and that's really what the theme was about, to tell people, I mean, how much has changed across the world as well as in India, uh, and how real this direct data digital marketing world is. Um, and that's really why we picked Marketing Made Smarter as a theme. Uh, there's obviously a lot that's changed around the world. Um, and to give you a couple of startling facts, uh, one of them is that, um, you know, for people who live in India, they find this surprising that the Ad, Ad Age Family Tree Report actually ranks Ogilvy 1 as larger than Ogilvy. Um, Wonderman, Rap, and Ogilvy 1 are all three larger than Ogilvy, and they're twice the size of Lowland as globally, um, which sort of in, is indicative of the real changes that the da data direct and digital worlds bringing through, right? And that's kind of reflected in the numbers. It's also important to note that it's companies like these that are more likely to be picked to be part of um, lists like the adage A-list, uh, which is reflective of companies that have brought in the largest amount of change, innovation, and new thinking into the world of marketing and advertising. Um, and to, if, you, if you look at the stuff that the data, digital, and direct marketing world has brought in, the kind of changes that you see seem somewhat instinctively smarter. Like, for example, you have this scene called test before you launch, concepts like design of experiments and stuff like that that have come in, right, which, look, which sound like look before you leap, you know, something we were sort of taught many, many years ago, right? Earned media sounds instinctively cheaper and smarter than paid media, right? There's also a whole new granularity uh, with which segmentation now happens, right? Um, there's locational targeting, which sounds a lot smarter than targeting people when they're in their bedrooms, uh, and so on and so forth. But the smartest thing that I did was actually pick a really smart panel of people, right, to talk to you about it. I threatened them to pe prepare uh, three-minute speeches, which they're going to now sort of unleash on you, right? So let me start um, by introducing these wonderful gentlemen that I have with me. That's Ramit Arora to my right. Uh, he is the senior director for McDonald's in India for marketing. Uh, that's Sanjoy Gupta. Sanjoy Gupta is executive vice president for marketing for Aegis Limited. This is not the Aegis media company. Uh, it's a outsourcing and consulting company. Uh, to my left is Satish. Satish is senior vice president for Draft FCB. Uh, Ravi Jaswani runs Digit9, which is a fairly, uh, you know, strong digital agency, which is, you know, multifaceted. Mahesh Murthy runs Pinstrom, which, and he's like the founder of Search Market in India. Um, so over to, who, who, would, who, who wants to go first? Okay. Sanjay. Hi. Um, so... Uh, I'm a bit new to Mumbai, so a lot of you uh, may not know uh, much about my background. I've had the good fortune of being in uh, the hallowed mainline agencies for most of my working career, over 25 years, and I've crossed over to the client side as a marketer uh, fairly recently. Um, and uh, you know, this whole divide between uh, mainline and the direct and digital is something that you experience day in and day out on, in the agency uh, side of the business. Uh, but I was just thinking that um, there's, there's a tendency to 
box in through labels a lot of what we do as marketers. And if I just take the essence of what we're talking about in terms of data, which is you know working with numbers uh, and uh, digital, which is working with technology, uh, there's so much that you can do both in marketing and in personal lives. And I just want to start with, uh, in my personal life, uh, how I use data and digital uh, for one of my hobbies. And I love words and I play Scrabble, uh, serious Scrabble. I play Scrabble um, competitively. I travel in India, across the, uh, even abroad, and I'm not bad. Um, and you wonder what's the connection between data and technology and words. And in order to prepare for Scrabble at this level, one has to have strategies. So there are about 180,000 words in the English dictionary, and uh, about 33,000 of them are seven letter words which give you high bonus points. So you can't learn all of them. So what we do is, we organize those into by order of probability. And then you learn based on probability. So once you do that, the li likelihood of you being in a winning position is much higher. And then you uh, play against computers which have simulators built in, and you hone your strategy on the basis of that. So that's d data and technology, uh, working at a personal level. Now on the professional level, uh, uh, Venkar is asking, you know, uh, what sort of experience and w where a conventional approach hasn't helped. And uh, in fact, this is an old story. About five years ago, I worked on a client called Dell Computers. And I was in an ad agency, and uh, the challenge before us was uh, quite different from the kind of challenges that ad agency typically get. Uh, you, every quarter, you were given a target. You had to drive a certain number of calls to a call center for their computers. Those calls had to be split in a particular ratio between different products. So servers, desktops, laptops, whatever. And there was a budget. And the budget had to be uh, optimized in a way in which all the co-op funds were used adequately fully. And the creators had to match the co-op funds. So this whole business, uh, in fact, they outsourced their marketing to an agency. Uh, and the whole business was run on Excel. And not a normal media plan Excel, but like an Excel with thousands and thousands of sh rows, hundreds of columns. Every marketing decision was represented. Every outcome was represented. And every morning, you got data from the IVR as to what was the number of calls you actually achieved, and what are the target for the week and for the day. And you had to redo your media plan for that day in order to drive the numbers. So that's, that's an approach. And that was, you know, uh, Jody was talking about how direct marketing is both marketing and advertising. Uh, or direct and advertising. And the channels that were used are, are both uh, media channels as well as direct marketing channels, catalog marketing, email marketing, the whole, uh, you know, web marketing, the whole, the whole gamut. And you can imagine the power you have when you know exactly what's the cost per call that Times of India gives you versus Hindustan Times. Uh, there's a tremendous uh, uh, ability to negotiate um, across uh, in, in terms of uh, media rates. So the, the value of data is, you know, it's, it's, it's immense. And of course, uh, you know, when you, when you have to drive your CPCs down quarter on quarter, that's you really an inefficient way. Uh, hi, good morning all. Uh, I'm, I think we're all in the slightly disadvantageous position of sitting in the bright light and looking out into the darkness out, out there. So, uh, I mean, we're at least happy that some of us seem awake right now at this, at this point in time. Uh, so it was really interesting that uh, Jody, the earlier speaker, spoke about data, technology, and channels. Uh, uh, as somebody who runs a company at Pinstorm, we currently manage or wrangle some 9 half terabytes of data. Uh, we use every single channel known to man and a few perhaps not even known to man uh, <laughs> from search to... Facebook to LinkedIn to Twitter to mobiles to whatnot. Uh, I actually think that if if you look deeper there, you'll find that the, the the real challenges are not in data, they're not in technology, and they're, they're not in channels. The real challenge, uh, challenges are, are, are really elsewhere. The, the two really big variables out here, and one is uh, uh, something we didn't spend uh, much time talking about, and I hope... Uh, uh, I'll probably come back uh, during a session later and talk a little more about it, which is really the uh, the human factor. Uh, how how are people uh, behaving? 
uh, what do they think, how do they act, how do they sense things, how do they emote, how do they respond to emotion. Uh, because you can take all the campaigns you want and use all the data you want and squeeze it through all the technology you want and pump it out through all the channels you want. But if you haven't understood human beings, it's, it's reasonably pointless. Uh, so I'll come to that and I'll come to a second point, uh, uh, which, is, which is really money. So if you look at people and money and you follow people and money through this entire channel, you'll figure out why marketing needs to be made smarter and, and uh, what possibly ails it and hopefully we can get a chat a little bit about, about that today. By, by some yardsticks uh, and perhaps uh, uh, a hit show on, on uh, uh, television uh, on the East Coast might be a, a yardstick, uh, the golden age of advertising was the 60s where uh, you had Burnback and uh, Doyle Dane and a bunch of other guys, Bill Tragos and others, who created incredible work from the uh, Volkswagen Lemon campaign to the LL campaign and, and so on and so forth. Uh, it was really a time when uh, people worked by gut instinct. Uh, people worked uh, with a very clear understanding of human nature, uh, really undiluted by the concerns. In some ways, it's a time also echoed by uh, Steve Jobs, who extraordinarily famously said, uh, what do you mean by consumer research? It's not the consumer's job to know what he wants. It's my job to know what he wants. I'm never going to do any research. Uh, you know, he was a man after most, and, and I speak as a copywriter, creative director, and uh, also, you know, uh, now agency owner. He was a man after most of our uh, hearts. We started somewhere there, and then in the next 20, 30 years, we went through a wave of consolidations, where essentially what really happened, the business was the money men took over. Right? Uh, even today, the world's largest advertising firms are run by accountants. Uh, good thing, bad thing, you know, uh, the question's up there. But if you follow the money and you see what's happened, certainly I've worked in, in the US and Europe. I've uh, been back in India for 10, 12 years. Uh, if you look at the business out here, uh, we have about 30,000 crores of uh, measured marketing spent, of which uh, maybe 3,000 crores is used in the production of creatives, and 27,000 crores is the media spent out there. Uh, I, I can translate that into uh, US dollars later, uh, but, but just bear with me for a while. Now the reason, so the, the, the system is so extraordinarily corrupt out here. You saw the revelations yesterday of uh, a television channel, NDTV, suing WPP and Nielsen simply because uh, in India, I don't know if many of you know, that the television ratings are up for sale. Uh, the, uh, when you put up a television program, uh, and I used to run a television channel, so I know my rivals used to do this, essentially before you put up the program, you went and bought the distributors and bought the sets where the people meters were so you could ensure the rating even before your program launched, right? So uh, uh, essentially if you look at it, the, the large media buyers in India today charge 1% uh, as, a, as a media fee to the client, but take 85 to 9% uh, as illegal kickbacks from the back and back from the media. So in a sense, they are extremely highly incentivized to the tune of two, 3,000 crore rupees to get the client to buy media, regardless of whether the client needs that media or not, because that's really where the money is. The second point is if you take the, uh, the creative production industry of two, 3,000 crores, about 1,500 crores goes into television ad film production, and about 750 crores of this is kickbacks that go back to the agency, which is uh, the client is overbilled and money goes back to the agency again, which means that the agency is extremely incentivized to get the client to buy expensive television commercials uh, costing a crore or $200,000, when essentially a, a $2,000 or $4,000 commercial can work much better on, on YouTube. So we, we, we basically came from a world where it was about understanding the soul of the consumer to a world driven by, you know, good, bad, or otherwise, accountants who said, let's make as much money as we can. What probably got, uh, happened out here was somewhere the advertiser and the client got shafted, right? So it, we lost track of whose ROI we were supposed to look after, our own or the client's. Now the really interesting thing that, uh, that this new world of digital brings to all of this is in some ways uh, it probably heralds uh, a bit of a turn back to some of the innocence of the past. A couple of ways. One, it's now extreme. I mean, technology has brought the cost down where you can, cho you can shoot high quality video stuff for two, three, four thousand uh, dollars at, you know, full broadcast resolution and, and produce it and bring it up there. Two, you have an enormous amount of paid media out there. Today as an agency, we run six or eight, uh, you know, communities on Facebook of more than a million people each. And we know we have the ability to reach that, that large number of people without really spending any media money whatsoever. Uh, and to put that in perspective, you know, the reach of India's largest event on television, the IPL, is probably three or four million people uh, in the 18 to, 20, 18 to 35 age group. And you know you can reach 14 million on Facebook alone any given day, right? And about 52 million a month. So the, 
you know, on the media side, there's much, there's, there's significant pressure actually to move towards earned media because of uh, this extraordinary leakage that's happening on the paid media front, both in terms of the corruption in the ratings and the corruptions in, uh, in, the, in the buying process. On the creative process, again, it's become cheaper to produce high quality creative. So there's clients this year who are beginning to say, okay, look, I can do one commercial for $200,000, but forget that. Let me do 20 for $2,000 each and see how, uh, you know, how they do. And we're beginning to see some successes already happen out there. So in some ways, I mean, what, uh, and I, I speak as a grizzled old, whatever, 28, whatever year veteran of uh, this business, I see in some ways a welcome return to the age of madmen, a welcome return to the age of insight, acting on insight, free of corruption, free of figuring out where exactly, uh, you, know, uh, you know, my pocket gets lined and where, you know, where I take money away from somebody else. In some sense, the, the transparency and purity of working in a, in a system which is not opaque, which is open and clean, where again, it's pretty much made the best idea win and made the, made the best execution win. I think all of this is in some ways the answer to, you know, Lord Lever's question of, uh, you know, I know, I know which, I know half of my advertising is wasted, I don't know which half. I, I think all of us in the, in the data-driven marketing industry pretty much can not just say exactly which half, but you know, which percentile and which 4.3% is wasted by, by how much. So I think it's, uh, we've, we've gone through these 30, 40 years, we've seen a really welcome change happen out here, and I hope we can take, take on some of these issues as we talk today. Thanks. Thanks, Mahesh. For a while I was wondering whether you, you, you thought that things were getting worse with the money man, but you brought it back on subject rather smartly in the end. Thank you so much. Uh, Ravi, you want to go? Yeah, hi. I'm Ravi Jaswani, and I started Digit9 about seven years back when we saw the need. You know, the digital was picking up. We were already running a mass media agency by the name of Nine Wins. We specialized in entertainment marketing. Now, that's not something that a lot of people do. So, we do movie marketing is what we specialize in. And for those of y'all who, who see movies, you'll realize a movie like Dirty Picture was an easy one to market. And I'm sure most of y'all would have seen it. What uh, Jody was mentioning is the blurring lines between different, uh, you know, BTL, ATL, and uh, direct marketing. Post Dirty Picture, which was a super hit movie, we were landed with the challenge of marketing Kahani, with the same actress in a completely different role, you know, completely different as in plain Jane woman from the sexy oom factor that she was portraying in a previous movie. And the challenge light that the budgets were low, the actors were, you know, in a completely different unseen role before. And uh, I'll tell you the story of Kahani as to what, what direct marketing was, how it was used to get people into the theaters. Okay, so we started with a very simple idea. So it's not supposed to be expensive, like my friend just mentioned out here. It's not a $200,000 campaign or something like that. So we started by just putting charcoal drawn posters of a person on the streets of the metros, you know, and uh, just saying, missing man, can you help us find him? And uh, down there was a small message saying, if you find him, please get on to facebook.com slash Kahani the film. And people started noticing these posters and started, you know, uh, telling each other about it and thinking they're doing a social cause. Went on to Facebook with the same message saying, if you find this gentleman, and it was a story about an NRI guy, uh, you know, coming to India and getting lost and his wife trying to find him. Message traveled all the way to London, you know, asking people like, have you seen this person coming into India and stuff like that. It went so viral that we then decided to go mass with it. We went on to SMSs, to BBM, to WhatsApp. And uh, coming to ROI, we had a 13% hit rate, people forwarding it to their friends. So like you said, you know, one person said to eight and the next eight and the next eight. It just went on to such a limit. The mass media campaign had not started at that time. So people just thought they were doing a social cause trying to find a person. You know. And by the time the, the main movie communication started, people said, wow, you know, this is, we have fallen prey to a trick. There was a, you know, terms and conditions saying, if you find this gentleman, please log on to Facebook and let us know about it. They were so emotionally connected with the movie by the time they realized that, you know, what they had done and it, it was all over it. Television channels picked it up saying, you know, find this gentleman and report it to these guys. So it's all about, you know, it's not about which medium you use, it's about how you use the medium. It's about, you know, using it correctly, getting, getting people to connect with it. So it's not about uh, making them buy and see the movie, but making them connect with it. And to the people who are here and from India, they know that Kani went on to become the biggest blockbuster of the year, you know. With, with the star cast, which, with the storyline was good, obviously the content was obviously good, but uh, the, uh, the driving force to the movie, it was not something that people would go to like in a must watch situation. But uh, by the time the movie released, people were so connected to that movie, they said that we cannot miss it because we have been part of it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's blurred, like you said. 
And uh, digital marketing to me, it's always going to remain the you know, tip of the iceberg because it's so evolving that every day there's something new happening. So you can't rest back and say, okay, I am an expert in digital marketing. You know? And direct marketing, it's all about connecting with the consumer. It's, it's not only about trying to sell them something. So, and I'm sure everybody out here has a social media account. There's nobody out here who will say, you know, I'm out of this medium. So connecting with them is, is what is required as of today and nothing better than direct marketing for it. Good morning, everyone. Uh, when Batsal approached me saying that, and his team approached saying that they were going to start a DMI, I, I thought really the time had come, the right time for this, uh, op for this particular forum. So thank you so much. Uh, I spent about, I began my career by in FMCG sales, and then moved on to brand marketing, brand management. I worked with companies like Johnson and Rekit and Boots uh, before I moved this side of the fence uh, and started uh, my own digital company, which we didn't see, we didn't, we didn't really go on far. But uh, I think the, the medium, the way it has, has really evolved. I mean, one, one is really realizing that it has got far immense potential. Uh, I would like to go back to one of the campaigns we had done for a client called Western Union many, many years back, uh, where we realized that there's a great opportunity in reaching to, in creating a database for the first time ever, reaching to the customers there and getting more and more transfers happen and we really s saw success and the whole program got uh, absorbed in entire Asia Pacific and went on to own by the client. Uh, and as we move further, we realize that uh, with more and more channels being added to the medium, uh, it is really, is really taking away from the mainstream medium. Uh, I, I know very clearly when we started off uh, Nobody even really, really, it really didn't matter to marketeers. Uh, today, I think uh, probably we are among the first few slides of the presentation when we present to marketeers. So that's how the marketing fraternity has really begun to recognize uh, the kind of work we do. Fortunately, I am from an agency which believes in integrated marketing. So whenever we go to our clients, we have a complete integrated ma marketing solution which is justice to all aspects of communication. Uh, and that has really powered the, the business the way we are doing. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Sadesh. You want to go next, Ramit? Uh, I'm actually also watching time, which is why I'm not interjecting with lots of conversation, <laughs> whatever. Uh, how much time do we have? Uh, five minutes? Okay, great. So you take three of that. I'll, I'll try and do it quicker. So uh, Venkat called me up one day and said, I need you to be on a panel in this uh, conference. It's the D DMAI convention. And I wanted to sound intelligent, so I quickly Googled. And I realize there's direct marketing, and I've never done direct marketing in my life. Uh, but I didn't want to say no to Venkat because he's like, I think you, you need to be on this panel. You can contribute. You know, Venkat can be very persuasive. And I thought about it, and uh, I realized, and it was it was a big realization that uh, uh, that uh, you know, databases, uh, precision measurement. Uh, ROI had become such an important part of our lives in the last few years that, uh, you know, willy-nilly we had, uh, I had graduated from, you know, being what I thought was a mass market, as you would imagine McDonald's would be, uh, to, you know, somewhere uh, in the middle of this whole conundrum of what is mass marketing, what is direct marketing. So, so very quickly, and I won't take more than a minute, uh, the obvious benefit of, uh, of direct marketing and genuinely uh, having access to customers is really for the customers because the customer has access to you. And uh, I find often we're very scared of that. We're very scared of customers uh, having access to the company and the brand and not having to go through call centers who can say, I don't know, I'm not authorized, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you know, it, it's, it, takes a, it takes a lot of courage to actually give customers access to you and uh, uh, the ability to ask you questions, to transact. Uh, there is, of course, the parallel benefit for the uh, marketer, and that's where, you know, that's what gives us courage, which is you give the right information to the right person at the right time. Uh, of course, it's more profitable as well because, you know, you take away everything that's in the middle. So an online transaction or somebody uses his mobile phone to break a line uh, is so much more profitable than having to put four people who will talk to him and, you know, try and convince him to order food. Uh, so clearly it's profitable. Uh, nobody can doubt the ROI debate. Uh, 
you know, more precision is more ROI. Very difficult to doubt that. Not always more business, but for sure more ROI. Uh, I think the only other thing I'd like to add to this is, you know, the whole concept of live brands. And uh, McDonald's around the world, increasingly in India, is, is digitizing their merchandising, their menu boards, moving on to the internet, allowing people to order before they walk into restaurants, and so on and so forth. Uh, what that basically means is uh, not only do you have history of customers, what they're doing, who they are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and, you know, literally in our business, proof of the pudding lies in the eating, you know, uh, because you know what they're eating. And if you know what they're eating and if you know what they like, you know what you can throw up. But more importantly, if it's raining outside, you can offer a coffee, and if it's not, you can offer a dessert, a cold dessert, you know. And so as brands become live uh, and customers become... Uh, sort of live customers and not some inanimate objects who are put into buckets uh, and thought of as annual plans. I think direct marketing and digital and technology have bigger roles to play. And I think that really is the summary of uh, where I want to go. We actually do a lot of work with McDonald's across the world. And um, McDonald's, McDonald's, in fact, is one of the best users of direct data and digital marketing uh, across the world. And uh, they've been setting uh, new standards of where that can go and uh, how precise you can get with where your money goes and so on and so forth. Uh, but I guess we don't have enough time to talk that through. So I had prepared three smart questions, okay? I'm going to stay with one. I'm going to ask these guys that, and then we'll sort of just conclude that, right? So here's my question, right? So, um, so you know, we keep talking about, you know, marketing having been made smarter and so on and so forth. And I want to especially ask these two gentlemen on my right, right, how much of that smart is actually forced on them because of the fact that the consumer has now acquired a voice, right, that there is a recession, that there is increasing competition, and how much of it is of their own volition, right? Um, is that a controversial enough question to, for you to go for? Yeah. yeah. It's easily the most controversial question you could ask. So a lot of it is forced on, uh, forced on us by customers. Truth be told, a lot of it is forced on us by investors, by managements, uh, increasingly by uh, somebody sitting in uh, in countries where you know global brands are listed and you know uh, stock markets going up and down and managements around the world saying, uh, I, "I'm tired of hearing 50% of the money sort of is productive and 50% isn't." So a lot of it is also driven not just by recession, but by the fact that I think accountability has become a big part of a marketer's life. And, can't run away from that should be as well. Uh, some of it by customers who are now accustomed to uh, having the right to ask questions. Uh, they don't like the fact that uh, questions go unanswered. So uh, you know they're they're pretty uh, pretty rough on brands that don't answer questions or are unable at the point of access to answer questions. Uh, I I still think uh, it's it's not an easy solution. Uh, ROI is a good argument, and ROI is mostly the argument marketers uh, take to give access customers access to information and brands and transactions and stuff, and empower them to choose what they want. Uh, but it's still very, very, it's a, still a very, very tough decision because uh, you're actually uh, saying to yourself that the customer is really in charge and he's running your company and he's running your brand. And you want, you're only responding to what he wants. You're, you know, you're almost the service end of a company he's running. So it, it, it's tough. I mean, customers are forcing you to go there, but I think uh, uh, accountability is the is the bigger driver at this point of time. I don't see many marketeers around me, uh, and I, I'd say that for myself as well. Uh, going 100% of the way, giving customers a kind of charge that we'd like to put up in our presentations and say we do. Uh, I don't think we do that necessarily. Uh, in the cases of uh, the clients we work with, I mean, the interesting thing, some of them are extraordinarily large. There's a telecom company with 190 million customers in India alone, another 50 million in 15 other countries. There's a bank with 25 million customers, and a Cadbury a, a chocolate company, which is the largest in this part of the world. When you have such enormous numbers of customers, uh, two things happen. One, uh, there's a they're very good marketers at these companies who've had a particular way of working with traditional media for the last 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, and it's very hard for them to come to the realization that 190 million customers own me because I thought I used to own them, right? Uh, one, when the realization comes, 
it's also extremely hard for you to be able to gear up to deal with that kind of volume. So we talk about listening to consumers. I can tell you for this telecom company, we listen to about 550,000 consumer mentions of our brand every month. That's about six and a half million a year. I don't know too many other firms around the world that do larger listening in one country on any one brand alone, right? And then you've got to sit back, analyze, figure out was it positive, negative, was it visible, and so on and so forth. Now, based on cu customer sentiment about us, we also have to, of, co of course, measure the rivals. Now we do the strategy based on that. So it's really an upside down way of doing it. I mean, earlier people said, this is a strategy, now let me go out. Now you're sitting back and saying, let me listen to all these 550,000 pieces of data in a month and come back and say, do I need to fine tune my strategy? So, uh, and third, and probably the most critical thing is, it's easy to do all of this in theory, but actually, to implement it, uh, forget the agencies, we are small, we are flexible, we can change our way around, right? The biggest change has to come when the client or the market has to suddenly say, okay, you know what, I had nobody in this listening function. Now, you know, for example, the telecom company has 23 people, the bank has eight people. They're, they have to hire people, change their, you know, their org, org chart structure, create a new reporting environment, you know, have people with, within media, pro, uh, legal product, uh, you know, customer service all, you know, sit in one council. Uh, thanks to Kotler, they were all sitting in different silos. Now you've got to break all of that and say, okay, now all of this is to work together. So it's really systemic organizational change that is really the problem. The theory is not a problem. The execution of the theory into practice at the client side at companies with 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people, that's really the issue. Uh, and that takes a little time to solve. So the intention is there, but there's, there is dead wood. I mean, you can't really go walking into a 50,000 person company and say, I'm going to reorg it. You know, the, so that's really the issue. Yeah, the oh, last words, cool. So, um, you know, for the reasons uh, both these gentlemen have referred to, obviously customers expect to interact a lot more with companies, which suits a company like mine quite well, because um, we make our, uh, our uh, bread and butter out of customer interactions. We do about a billion customer interactions a year. And you can imagine the kind of data and the, the kind of insights that can be got from mining that, those one billion interactions. And just to give an example, um, uh, in, in many companies, uh, in many industries, customer lifetime value, which is a term that I guess everybody here is familiar with and uses a lot, but it's something that you try to manage. And so how do you improve customer lifetime value? And of course there are various ways, but uh, one of the simplest ways is to reduce churn. So if you, if you had insights which told you when your customer is likely to churn out, uh, you can suddenly like take him out of your normal customer care service and put him in another uh, kid club care bucket and reduce, you reduce the churn. And that's exactly what we've done uh, through a um, you know, study of some, uh, some sets of data that we had. We found um, something like what we call the agony threshold. So actually by observing behavior which comes in through the data feeds, we really know who's reached the agony threshold and needs to be pulled out of a normal I, I love this, we have an agony threshold for customers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's exactly it, it's, that's, that's the point. Because you're, so you, it's a fact, you're all, your clients are always looking at optimizing their cost to serve. So how do you keep them within your bucket without you know, uh, going out of the optimal uh, range? Yeah. Another point I just want to bring out, which is a great, a, great, <laughs> a great lesson from IBM. Uh, IBM about uh, six weeks ago, and, and just to tell you that, you know, we think of our industry as being direct marketers and agencies like, uh, but uh, they advertise in the Wall Street Journal, full page ad targeted at CMOs. And what were we doing then? The whole message, the headline had, was said something like, welcome to the chief executive customer. And it had subheads which had, there's a beautiful phrase they use, which is the data of desire. And I think that's the trick because you can't go down one path only. You've got to, you've got to marry the science and art. You've got to marry the left brain, the right brain. You've got to look at data as finally being your route to get to building, creating desire and joy. Thank you very much, Sanjoy. Uh, thanks, Mahesh. Thanks, Ravi. Thanks, Satish. Thanks, Sanjoy, and thanks, Ramit. Uh, Trust you enjoyed this panel. Thanks for having us here.